screen. Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm the senior archivist at Witness. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Witness, um, we're an international nonprofit organization that trains and equips human rights um, defenders to use video and technology um, to expose abuse and to fight for justice and change. So today I'll be speaking about accessible workflows for collecting and preserving video evidence for human rights. Um, I know that many of the presentations um, at the symposium so far have been quite technical or very technology focused, um, and this presentation is not, so it's a little bit of an outlier, but I thought it perhaps it would be helpful to start the day by looking at a larger context for the technical discussions that we're having um, and the impact that um, uh, preserving audiovisual materials um, can have in people's lives outside of archives. And to situate some of the problem solving um, we're doing about tools and formats in relation to the ways that the AV preservation community can support and respond to the needs and challenges of people um, who are fighting for human rights. Um, so um, to orient our discussion, I'm going to start with three brief examples of videos um, that have been used as evidence in different contexts um, that show, I think, the increasing value of audiovisual records um, to human rights and the importance of having accessible, safe, and secure ways of creating, collecting, preserving, and sharing video. Um, and then I'll spend the rest of my presentation talking about two projects that Witness has collaborated on in this past year with our partners, one that involves archiving um, community documentation of police violence in the United States, and the other involving archiving social media evidence of state violence and genocide against the Rohingya minority in Burma. Um, so rather than show you any uh, graphic videos throughout this presentation, I'm just going to be using stills that do not include uh, very highly graphic um, material. Um, so this image comes from a video that was introduced as evidence in a military tribunal in Bukavu uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, just last month. It marked the first time that video was used as evidence in a Congolese trial. Um, this video was filmed by a lawyer um, who was trained by Trial International and Witness um, showing mass graves in two villages in South Kivu where 40 people were tortured and killed in 2012. Um, an attendee at the trial said that the atmosphere in the hearing chamber changed dramatically when the video was shown because it so powerfully conveyed the brutality of the crimes and the level of violence um, that the victims had suffered. And ultimately, two high-level mil militia commanders were convicted um, for the torture and the killing and received life, sentence life sentences. Um, so this example is one where a uh, situation where there's a, a trained professional advocate um, was filming in a controlled and planned way in the aftermath of an incident and produced a court-ready video. To ensure that they could sufficiently demonstrate the authenticity of the original footage that was uh, for the court, the lawyer filmed the footage using a specialized app called Eyewitness to Atrocities that was created by the International Bar Association to capture important device metadata and to facilitate a closed chain of custody from camera to secure storage. Um, but of course, not all video evidence situations can be so well um, planned and controlled as we'll see next. Um, so in 2015, um, Walter Scott, uh, who was an African-American man, was shot in the back multiple times and killed by police officer Michael Slager um, after a traffic stop in South Carolina. In his police report, um, Officer Slager reported that Scott had grabbed his taser and that he shot Scott out of fear for his life. He didn't know at the time that a bystander named Faden Santana had actually filmed the incident on his mobile phone. Um, Santana had actually held back the footage because he was afraid of retaliation um, from the police, but after consulting with the family and a local advocate, he released the video to the media. The video shows that Walter Scott was actually unarmed and running away from the officer at the time that he was shot multiple times in the back. Um, and the video also shows that after um, Scott was shot, uh, Officer Slager picked up his taser and dropped it next to Scott's body. So um, this video completely repudiated the officer's account and was a key piece of evidence in the officer's conviction for second degree murder and obstruction of justice for his false testimony. At a press conference, the attorney for the Scott family asked rhetorically, what if there was no video? Um, and my guess uh, is that there might have been a very different outcome. So the last example um, I want to share uh, reflects an increasingly common scenario 
um, video that's found on social media um, where the original source is maybe unknown. Um, this kind of video can also serve as evidence with some extra work. Um, last year, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Mahmoud al Warfali, a commander in the Al Saika unit of a group called the Libyan National Army, um, for murder as a war crime, including the execution of 33 prisoners near Benghazi between 19, uh, 2016 and 17. Um, in a first for the ICC, the warrant was based solely on evidence from seven videos found on social media. Um, it's not certain who the original sources of the videos are, but they appear to be produced and shared by members of the Saika Brigade themselves. And the first of the seven videos that was used as evidence was actually taken down by the original source shortly after it was posted, so it was actually only available because somebody else had saved it. Um, because of the lack of provenance and chain of custody, a lot of investigative work is required to, under, to identify, understand, and authenticate these kinds of videos. Um, the online investigation site, Bellingcat, for example, performed in-depth research to try to track down the Warfali videos, to geolocate the sites, um, and determine the sources of the videos using corroborating materials like satellite photos that you can see here. And you can read more about their really extensive process on, on um, at that URL there down at the bottom. So I think these examples illustrate the growing importance of video as a source of evidence in human rights cases. Um, and they also show how factors like authenticity, provenance, safety and security of sources, identification, uh, findability, and preservation, all things that we're concerned about, um, come into play in th their usability and weight as evidence. Um, so now I'd like to turn to two projects that we've been working on in the past year, um, collab collaborating with partners to gather, preserve, and use human rights evidence. Um, so the, the first project, um, Profiling the Police, is a two-part project that we have been working on with community organizations, El Crito de Sunset Park in Brooklyn, New York, and Kirk Berkeley Cop Watch in California, um, to archive and make more accessible the videos that they've been recording as part of their work monitoring the police. Um, just as, a, as an example of the kind of incidents that El Grito um, documents, um, in 2014, um, NYPD officers approached a family who was who were working as fruit vendors um, at a street fair uh, in Brooklyn after they were packing up their table. Um, the situation escalated and the police ended up tackling and beating the young man there who's in the baseball cap, Jonathan Daza, and, and then charging Jonathan and his two sisters with disorderly conduct, harassment, and uh, resisting arrest. So um, that might have been it, but just as in the Walter Scott case, there was video. Collected and released by El Crito, it shows the police acting violently, including an officer who forcefully kicked Jonathan as he lay on the ground restrained by other officers. Um, Bill Bratton, the NYPD police commissioner, viewed the video and even he said that it was totally unprovoked. Um, so instead of no consequences for the, for the police, which is so often the case, the charges were dropped against the Daza family and the officer who kicked Jonathan was suspended for 30 days. So, we wanted to work with El Grito to help them archive their collection of videos like these so that they continue so that they could continue to use the video to demand accountability. And communi community documentation is especially valuable um, because in many states in the US, um, including New York, um, uh, the state laws limit public access to police personnel records, um, leaving people to rely on themselves to identify repeatedly abusive officers in their communities. So these are the planning stages uh, of the, oh, sorry, the overall stages of the project. Um, and we developed uh, and documented workflows for each stage. So planning, collecting and selecting, capturing mini DV tapes because they also had uh, mini DVs in their collection, processing and ingesting video files to storage, description, including developing a very basic cataloging scheme and uh, using videos and other public information then to uh, create officer profiles or officer timelines. So in developing our workflows and deciding what tools to use, we kept in mind that El Crito is a volunteer-run grassroots organization with a lot of other pressing priorities. So at the same time as this project was going on, for example, Hurricane Maria had hit Puerto Rico and El Crito was organizing a massive uh, donation effort in their neighborhood. So the workflows we developed were intended to be reproducible um, by volunteer-based groups with minimal resources. 
They had to be easy to follow or easy to learn with basic training. The tools had to be free or inexpensive. Um, we didn't want people to feel defeated or frustrated at any point. Um, so everything had to be uncomplicated to install and get up, uh, up and running. It had to work reliably, had to be easy to use, and even like fun or rewarding to operate. Um, because of this, we ended up uh, using both proprietary and open source uh, resources and tools and developing a few um, resources um, uh, on our own. Um, so developing policies is sometimes the hardest part of the process. So at the start of the project, we needed a way to decide which videos would be included based on the project goals. And so we created planning worksheets, they're really simple. Um, that we eventually published as a workbook. So the workbook allows users to walk through the planning process through just answering a set of questions. And in the published version, we include our completed worksheets as examples for, that others can look at. Um, and as I mentioned, we relied on a mix of open source and proprietary tools in our workflows. Um, and in the, in our, so in our pre-ingest stage, we needed just to get the contents off of El Grito's hard drive and the content off their mini DV tapes into an accessible workspace so that they could be reviewed and selected by volunteers. Um, so you can see the simple pre-ingest workflows for the hard drive above and then the workflow for the mini DV tapes below and some of the familiar tools that um, we use to copy and inventory the drives and capture the tapes. Um, so once we had captured the tapes and selected the materials according to our collection policy worksheets, um, we used Exactly, which is an open source GUI for Bagot um, creation and validation um, to organize and package our materials. Exactly was actually very uh, easy to use and did uh, what we wanted it to do, although I'd say that the worthwhileness of packaging and hashing is not really um, obvious to um, most users and, and you have to take some convincing in terms of like take, make, why it's worth making the effort to do that. Um, for description, we use Google Sheets. Um, we didn't start out with a clear metadata scheme for describing the videos and their content, instead just developing it as we went along. Um, and this was a useful process to go through in terms of learning what was important to capture in the videos, but it required a lot of inter iteration and in the end the data was really quite messy, although still usable for finding individual videos. Um, we ended up ab abstracting this sort of organic scheme into a model that El Grito could potentially use going forward um, and that we further developed uh, with Berkeley Copwatch. Um, and just to note that ERD Plus was a really useful free web tool um, for drawing the models that I used, and then we created a test implementation in FileMaker. So with the help of our spreadsheet, um, we, used, we used the videos and other documentation that we collected to create timelines for two officers and the incidents that they had been involved in on a WordPress site. On the site, we also provided um, background on the issue and analysis of the video collection and takeaways from our project, and also published all of our step-by-step -step instructional documentation um, of our workflows as a toolkit, and it's all on that site. Okay, so the second part of this project, of the Profiling Police project, um, is with Berkeley Copwatch and is currently in progress. So Berkeley Copwatch is one of the earliest Copwatch groups starting in 1990, co-founded by Andrea Pritchett. Um, Berkeley Copwatch, they run uh, regular Copwatch patrols, they hold people's investigations, they lead Know Your Rights trainings, and they also run, uh, actually run a class on Copwatching at UC Berkeley um, through their decal program. Um, so Berkeley Copwatch has been collecting uh, videos and incident logs uh, for many years, and they wanted to make better use of that documentation to support individual cases, to use in lawsuits, to provide early warning of repeating of repeat offender officers, and to prove the existence of certain policing practices, and to serve as a, a, a research resource. Sorry, I'm hearing feedback. Are you hearing that too? Okay. Um, so Berkeley, Berkeley Copwatch has many of the resource limitations of other grassroots groups, of course, but it's also farther ahead in some ways. Um, they've been around for over 25 years as a volunteer-run operation. Um, they have an office space, but only one computer. Uh, they have cameras that volunteers can sign out and hard drives to store the footage, but the footage isn't always offloaded and properly organized and labeled at the end of everybody's shift. Um, they have great documentation in the form of written incident reports, phone logs, and actually even an old FileMaker database. But data entry into that has been inconsistent because the database was not structured in an optimal way for it to actually be useful to anybody. So 
Our project with them involved clarifying their video collection policy, redesigning the database with their end uh, purposes in mind with more structure and better documentation, and streamlining the video ingest workflows from camera to storage um, and inputting that information into the database. So <clears throat> uh, after a few months uh, that have included meetings, trainings, testing, we're currently working on um, a collaborative workflow documentation. And just to note that um, we're using Dropbox paper instead of Google Docs, and it's so much better. <laughs> I don't know if any of you used it. Um, and we're also testing the new database. So the new database um, enables uh, Berkeley CopWatch to track information about officers, participants, incidents, videos, other documentation, and follow-up actions. Um, it's built in FileMaker, so it's not, uh, you know, it's a proprietary database application which has its pros and, pros and cons. On the pro side, um, they were already using it. It's really not too expensive if you just buy the single version. Um, and there was actually, there's really nothing else like it. It's really easy to set up. It's really easy to design. It's really easy to use. It has a pleasant interface. Um, and actually, what was most helpful for me is that it has a huge user base, um, and there's a lot of online document. Like, anything you want to figure out how to do, there's somebody has written a tip on how to do that. Uh, but we're also, also aware of its limitations. Um, of course, you know their installation was out of date. We had to pay to relicense it. And we only paid for a single installation, not the server version, because the server version is much more expensive. Um, and while the data isn't stuck in FileMaker, the functionality, like all the, the work we did making layouts and scripts, that all is stuck in there. And so you know, we part of our goal is to share um, tools. And so the, the only thing we can share out of this is the documentation, unless you know, another group is also using FileMaker. So, okay, so now I wanna talk about um, the second project, and how am I doing for time? Good, okay. So the next, the, uh, the next speaker is up in 10 minutes. Okay, okay, know. got it. Um, so the second project, um, the, is uh, the Rohingya Genocide Archive. Um, it's a project that we're supporting to find, collect, and preserve social media, um, social media video, um, that's documenting genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity that is being perpetrated by the Burmese military against an ethnic minority in Burma, the Rohingya. Um, for security reasons, I can't publicly mention our partner pu at the moment, um, but it is a Rohingya-led initiative based in Southeast Asia. And we were really fortunate to hire a Rohingya person who's active in his community as the archivist for this project. Um, so while we provided the training on the archival workflows, um, all, you know, all the work of selection and description of these materials requires knowledge of the situation, the actors, the language, the locations, um, and a lot of dedication to seeing this through. Um, and I imagine uh, most of you are familiar um, with the situation, but in case not, um, the Rohingya people are a marginalized and stateless minority um, in Burma. There have been numerous crackdowns by the military um, since 2011, like the most like horrible, unspeakable forms of violence, um, including um, in August of 2017, a so-called clearance operation that massive, massive widespread violence. Um, it's a major humanitarian crisis. Thousands of people have been killed. Um, over um, 700,000 Rohingya have fled. Um, there's a, a recent UN fact-finding mission has recommended an investigation and prosecution of the Burmese military for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. And right now, the ICC um, is uh, has a preliminary uh, examination underway, looking into the forced deportation of Rohingya um, to Bangladesh. Um, so the role of social media also is huge um, in terms of communication and information sharing. Facebook is basically the stand, a stand-in for the internet. Um, you've probably seen reports like this in the news, however, about how, on one hand, val valuable documentation being uh, posted by Rohingya has been removed after the Burmese government have identified them as terrorists. Um, and then on the other hand, how the platform is also being inundated with anti-Rohingya fake news and hate speech. Um, among people, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp are the most common forms of communication. There are uh, dozens of public and semi-private WhatsApp groups in the Rohingya community where people chat and exchange information. 
Um, Twitter and YouTube are also tend to be used by activists, advocates, and media organizations in this space. Um, so there's a lot of firsthand accounts, photos, videos, and other documentation that's being shared on all of these channels, and of course are at great short-term preservation risk. So for our project, um, since content was being collected from social media and not directly from sources, we needed to take extra care to build transparent processes that clearly documented provenance and chain of custody. Um, we also wanted our processes to be replicable in other low resource um, contexts. Um, so we prioritized transparent workflows and open source tools um, wherever possible and collecting information as directly as possible from the platforms. Um, we also wanted to build workflows um, that people who don't consider themselves highly technical could do with minimal um, help or guidance, which I think is not something we've completely um, tackled. Um, so for Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, um, we use uh, YouTube DL. Um, to download video and some metadata. And YouTube DL is great, um, although the installation in the command line can be a little bit intimidating for new users. Um, and so far, the only issue we've encountered with YouTube DL is with um, Facebook videos that have a graphic warning where you have to like click through to get to the video. Um, and I'm not sure that that has been resolved. Um, to gather additional uh, metadata for the platforms, which we decided to make optional um, part of our packages, we're using the, the explorers or the web-based interfaces that Facebook, that Facebook and YouTube provide for their graph and their data APIs. <clears throat> So these explorers are actually meant for developers to quickly test their app settings, but they're useful as a simple um, graphical user interface for making queries and um, accessing metadata. So using these with, along with curl commands, um, we're able to gather the metadata for our selected videos. Twitter doesn't provide an explorer, but they do provide a command line tool called Twirl for developers, um, which is like curl, but uh, tailored specifically to the Twitter API. Um, so we can use that to make simple command line requests um, for the JSON data about selected tweets. WhatsApp is a little frustrating. There's no public API, so as far as we could figure out, you can only access the media and the chats um, and not much metadata using their built-in export chat option. And, and you can include the media in that export option. Um, uh, with iPhones, this process didn't present a problem at all, but for whatever reason, Android's, the only export option is export to Gmail, which has a file size limit. So you could only get partial chats and, and media. Um, and sort of the workaround is that you can download the media on your desktop app. Okay, so I'm gonna try to get through this. Um, all of the different packages are packaged using exactly, which I mentioned before, the same tool that we use for the El Grito project. Um, our archivist is cataloging in a Google spreadsheet, um, and the emphasis is on documenting the source of the video and basic description, um, including where and when it was filmed, and what you're seeing is just a portion of that. Um, as we continue to build the collection, we're also exploring how it can be used in investigative accountability and justice efforts, how it can be used by the community, how and how to make our workflows accessible to others. One more, yeah, I only have one more slide. Um, so <clears throat> in both of our projects, um, the tools exist for what we wanna do for the most part, but they're not at all, not all easy to use and not there's not always an open source option. Um, and I think often when we think of uh, GUI or easy guides, they're kind of like the cherries on top. And in fact, they're the difference between a lot of people using the tool and not being able to use them at all. Um, another need I put a question mark after is open source alternatives, like let's say to FileMaker. I think it would be nice, but as long as there's existing proprietary tools um, uh, that are inexpensive and allow you get the data out. I don't know if that's like much of a priority. Um, next, closed networks like WhatsApp are increasingly the way that videos are being distributed and delivered. So it'd be great to have strategies and tools for uh, collecting content metadata from these platforms. Um, in all of the projects, the metadata, metadata design was something that we worked on with our partners a lot. Um, the key to making use of videos is the metadata. Um, and it's often not just metadata about the videos, but about other entities that the videos relate to, like incidents or people, um, since the video is documenting something else. Um, so it'd be great if there were basic tools and resources to walk people through the process of deciding what data to collect, how to structure it, and what kind of rules to use. And then just the final thing is identifying um, 
uh, duplicate content um, across platforms because people are uploading to all of their accounts. People are re-uploading things, um, and there's no way to sort of identify duplicates. Um, so, of course, the biggest need is that of all this work we're doing to collect and preserve human rights evidence, it's only worthwhile if it actually contributes to actual justice, accountability, and change. And for that, there really is no time to wait. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I have <laughs> um, there, there's time for one quick question. Oh, okay. People that don't get to uh, raise their own voice. Um, we had a question, uh, which is that what metadata scheme and keywords did the El Grito finally go with for their final workflow? And is it also used in the FileMaker tables? Very um, technical question. <laughs> yeah, so the, the extracted model that we created um, is not one that they're actually using now, but was built into the Berkeley Copwatch project. Um, there's there's a there's a lot, but it's very yeah. like, very basic and it's describing incidents and the videos themselves, but not based on any existing standards. And there's another question for the RGA project: How are the social intelligence streams being aggregated and stored as a database? Human gathered or automated? It's human gathered, so we're not doing like a, like in the Syrian archive case. If you guys are familiar with the organization, that that's sort of like a massive like search term, download everything. This is a very human selected um, process.